Hello, I'm Dr. Raymond Steinbeck, Chief of Non-Invasive Cardiology at the Texas Heart Institute. Today I'll discuss non-invasive imaging in patients with chest pain. In late fall of 2021, the ACC published a new guideline on evaluation and diagnosis of chest pain, which emphasizes the role of non-invasive imaging. Almost simultaneously, the American Society of Echocardiography and the European Association of Cardiovascular Imaging jointly published the guideline Non-Invasive Imaging in Coronary Syndromes, and I will also touch on this document, which is complimentary. After this discussion, I hope that you will feel more comfortable making decisions about how to manage patients presenting with chest pain. Coronary syndromes can be divided into acute and chronic. The current guidelines divide non-invasive imaging tests into functional or physiologic stress testing and anatomic testing. Functional imaging tests include stress echo, nuclear stress, and cardiac MRI. Coronary CTA is the test for anatomic imaging. These tests may not be indicated in all patients with chest pain, particularly if there's low likelihood that this is cardiac in origin, or these tests may be used individually or in a complementary fashion. Deciding how to evaluate possible coronary syndrome patients and applying the proper non-invasive imaging study is nuanced and recommendations have been under evolution for the past 10 to 15 years. Let's start with some historical perspective. How are the current guidelines different or additive to our thinking? Here are the related guidelines published over the past 12 years. The older documents above the dotted line make strong recommendations for when to perform non-invasive testing, but the nuance of test selection is avoided. This is due to the lack of outcomes data for imaging and a tendency to leave the how-to details of specific imaging modalities for subspecialty society documents. In 2013, the ACC published a multimodality appropriate use criteria document for detection and risk assessment of a stable ischemic heart disease. This is the first of a long line of appropriate use criteria documents to address a disease process, coronary artery disease, and to address whether or not any functional or anatomic stress uh, imaging test is indicated in each of a long list of commonly encountered clinical scenarios. This exercise was designed to identify areas of potential overuse by consensus of stakeholders, since outcomes data for imaging tests were not available. This is a table for the 2013 appropriate use guidelines, uh, and we see this, the first six of 80 common clinical scenarios in that document. The clinical scenarios here separate symptomatic patients into low, intermediate, and high-risk pretest probability of CAD their ECG appearance, and the ability to exercise. Consensus was reached amongst a rating panel as to whether any of the non-invasive imaging modalities were appropriate or might be appropriate, or were they in fact rarely appropriate. The rating panel was specifically guided not to rank amongst the modalities in a competitive fashion, so while this document helps to identify overuse, it is not too helpful when it comes to providing guidance on which test to use. The AUC documents remain relevant quality tools, however, for helping to reduce unnecessary use, particularly in stable outpatients, where patterns of imaging overuse have been documented. The Intersocietal, the Intersocietal Accreditation Commission requires uh, still that labs performing non-invasive tests assess appropriate use as one component of required quality improvement programs. The 2019 European Society of Cardiovascular Imaging Guideline for the Diagnosis and Management of Chronic Coronary Syndromes states that selection of initial non-invasive tests based on clinical likelihood of coronary disease and other patient characteristics that influence test performance, local expertise, and the availability of tests is indicated. This document uses chronic coronary syndrome as opposed to the ACC's stable ischemic heart disease classification. This newer guideline emphasizes the crucial role of healthy lifestyle behaviors and other preventative actions in decreasing the risk of subsequent cardiovascular events and mortality and discusses the utility of non-invasive testing for potentially influencing patient outcome. This guideline is helpful from a taxonomy standpoint. It identifies six categories of chronic coronary syndromes, two without a prior di diagnosis of coronary disease, either with symptoms suspicious for CAD or new onset heart failure with suspected coronary disease etiology. The remaining four included patients with established coronary disease, either symptomatic or symptomatic,
asymptomatic and late after diagnosis or revascularization or early. And new emphasis is placed on patients with ischemia and no epicardial coronary disease as suspected <coughs> um, from non-invasive testing. This is also known as ENOCA. And finally, number six, asymptomatic individuals with diagnosis of subclinical coronary disease detected on screening evaluations, and this would include anatomic testing using CTA. All of these are scenarios that are classified as chronic coronary syndromes, but they may involve different risk for the development of future events, and the risk may change over time, and non-invasive imaging is important for both disease classification and this risk stratification. This illustration from the ESC guidelines shows why stable ischemic heart disease classification could be misleading as patients with chronic coronary syndromes uh, could uh, become unstable depending on their management. In the upper right, you can see how this could happen. A patient could become unstable at any time and have an adverse outcome even though labeled as chronic ischemic, stable ischemic heart disease in the moment. The trajectory can be uncertain depending upon revascularization status and the intensity of risk factor modification. This illustration from the ESC 2019 guideline on chronic coronary syndromes shows how we may think about the risk in these patients with known disease by incorporating symptoms, comorbidity, and echo findings including LVEF when trying to choose the best non-invasive tests. Patients with very low risk on the left side need no testing. Consideration of anatomic coronary CTA is a good consideration in lower to intermediate risk patients without known disease. CTA has a very high uh, negative predictive value. A negative uh, test is truly a negative test, and it offers the opportunity to discover subclinical plaque which can potentially improve the trajectory of at-risk patients if preventative measures are implemented, as suggested by the Scott Heart Trial. In this trial, it was demonstrated a significant lower rate of combined endpoint of cardiovascular death or non-fatal MI in patients who had management with coronary CTA versus those managed with treadmill stress ECG testing as usual care evaluation. This is presumably due to management of detected subclinical disease, but other randomized uh, prospective trials such as the PROMISE trial have not shown a survival advantage of CTA strategy over traditional stress imaging strategies. The intermediate risk patients, those in the center, uh, benefit from non-invasive stress testing and it may be useful with test choice based on patient characteristics and availability. In high-risk patients, an invasive approach is often needed. Importantly, recommendations from the 2019 ESC guideline include the recommendation for resting transthoracic echocardiogram as the initial test and in the management of patients with suspected coronary disease. This is to rule in or rule out other non-CAD causes of chest pain that could be cardiac in origin, including regional wall motion abnormality detection, determining ejection fraction, and diastolic dysfunction. Non-invasive functional testing for ischemia or CTA is, is recommended as an initial test in patients in whom coronary artery disease cannot be excluded by uh, a clinical assessment alone. Let's now consider patients with acute coronary syndromes. We just talked about chronic, but in acute uh, syndromes, until this past fall, the most recent guidance uh, was from, again, the European Society of Cardiology in 2020. In patients with suspected non-STEMI acute uh, coronary syndromes, a resting echo, again, is indicated in moderate-risk patients. And even in patients with high risk who are going for cath, an echo is indicated to assess ejection fraction, regional wall motion abnormalities, and, and for concomitant other cardiovascular conditions and complications of myocardial ischemia. In the moderate risk group, non-invasive imaging may be indicated after a resting echo has been performed and an acute coronary syndrome has been excluded. And now we come to the newly published American College of Cardiology chest pain guideline for evaluation and diagnosis. The document is strongly focused on the patient's overall clinical evaluation as being crucial for establishing a patient's pretest probability of disease and other factors that dictate whether or not non-invasive cardiac testing should be performed at all.
Patients are grouped into those with acute chest pain with and without established coronary disease and chronic chest pain with and without established diagnosis of coronary disease. An initial clinical assessment and classification of chest pain is essential. Only 10% of patients presenting to acute care facilities with chest pain on detailed evaluation can be said to have cardiac or possible cardiac chest pain based on their symptoms alone. The new guideline recommends that chest pain be described as cardiac, possibly cardiac, and non-cardiac. If the pain is possibly cardiac, it may be either ischemic or non-ischemic cardiac chest pain. Non-ischemic cardiac pain can be from pericarditis, severe valve disease, complications of prior myocardial infarction, aortic syndromes, stress cardiomyopathy, and acute RV failure. The new chest pain guidelines recommend that we abandon the use of typical and atypical chest pain because this can be confusing. Most ED patients with chest pain have nonspecific pleural or musculoskeletal chest pain, and these individuals require no non-invasive testing. Only around 10% have suspected cardiac chest pain, and notice the very, few, the very low frequency of proven cardiac chest pain in patients younger than age 45. The low accuracy of non-invasive testing in this low pretest probability group of younger patients is well known. Even in older patients with chest pain, though, true cardiac chest pain, the green arrows, is in the minority. However, in these older risk, high-risk patients with compelling symptoms, the risk is truly high, and there's a need for the re resources for accurate diagnosis. The guideline strongly recommends risk assessment guidelines be employed. Many such acceptable clinical tools are available, and they are listed in the guidelines. At our institution, we have used the heart score algorithm to classify patients. Using this score based on the history, including symptoms, EKG, age, and other risk factors, and troponin results, patients can be relatively consistently placed into low, intermediate, and high-risk groups. Validation studies have shown that low-risk patients have a less than 2% risk of major adverse clinical events at six weeks without further evaluation, and they can be safely discharged and further evaluated as outpatients. For a few years, we have used a chest pain protocol shown here. It is in keeping with the new chest pain guidelines. We do an initial clinical assessment, including all of the elements needed for the heart score. It is the intermediate risk patients with possible cardiac chest pain or suspected ischemic heart disease that we then consider non-invasive testing. Please notice that the routine use of resting transthoracic echo in intermediate and high-risk patients to further assess ischemic and potentially non-ischemic causes for chest pain appears in the bright, bright green, green block box. After the initial clinical risk assessment, the tests can be further used to classify patients into low, intermediate, and high-risk groups based on the test results and managed accordingly. This flowchart has been very helpful in managing length of stay given the number of patients presenting with chest pain. For in intermediate risk uh, results or for an equivocal test result, the cardiology team is typically on board and decides on further management. And of course, the high-risk test results often indicate the need for an invasive strategy. The relatively simple pretest probability tool from this guideline can also be used with risk based on age, gender, the nature of symptoms, and the coronary artery calcium score by chest CT if known. Shortness of breath can be an additive symptom of ischemic heart disease, particularly in older men. And again, non-invasive stress testing performs well in intermediate risk patients and less well in low and high risk patients because of the inherent test performance characteristics related to test sensitivity and specificity. We are not going to go through all of the extensive recommendations from flow charts and tables within the guidelines, but we'll, we, we will look at a couple. Here we see the stable chest pain with no known coronary artery disease table. In this group, non-invasive testing is recommended for intermediate and high risk, intermediate to high risk groups. In low risk patients, no testing is recommended except for select causes where the clinical assessment is inconclusive. In intermediate to high risk patients with stable chest pain and no known coronary artery disease, all non-invasive modalities may be indicated as shown in the center box with the blue arrow, but one test is not recommended above the others.
However, imagers know that in older high-risk patients, some tests are likely to perform better than old others. No test is perfect, and for inconclusive studies in these patients, noted by the red arrows, layered complementary testing is sometimes needed, particularly in complex cases. In patients with stable chest pain with known coronary disease, the management decision tree is more complex. This guideline does not pretend to provide the granularity of the nuanced mix of patient variables and test performance char characteristics that would be needed to lead to the best test selection in all cases. The new EACVI ASC guideline provides a needed focus on not just when to select the non-invasive imaging in patients with suspected or established coronary disease, it provides a more detailed discussion on which tests should be considered based on more nuanced descriptions of patient characteristics, not just when to do, but what to do. This document also highlights the importance of patient pretest probability assessment before determining whether or not non-invasive testing should be utilized. Let's look at the relative accuracy of stress imaging tests based on estimates of test sensitivity and specificity. All of the tests have very good sensitivity and specificity when it comes to utility in intermediate risk patients. Let's take a look at the results when we try to perform stress imaging in a very low risk population. Patients with a pretest probability of only 10%, say young adults with possible cardiac chest pain. Let's run 100 patients with a pretest probability of 10% through a test with an 80% 80, 80 sensitivity and 90% specificity. And stress echo would be in this range, a nuclear not far off. In this group, 10 of 100 patients have actual coronary disease and 90 have no coronary disease. If we focus on the 90 patients with no disease and apply a specificity of 90%, the, pre the testing process would yield 9 out of 100 patients with a falsely positive test result. And although the test identifies most patients having no disease, the percentage of positive tests that are false positives is 53%. Therefore, when the test uh, <clears throat> is positive in this low-risk group, the test is almost meaningless with a 53% false positive rate. Now let's look at very high pretest probability uh, of disease populations, older patients with risk factors and compelling symptoms. Pretest probability of uh, 80%. Let's run this high 80% pretest probability through the 80% sensitivity and 90% specificity test. Although 80% sensitivity is not bad, out of the 80 patients with real disease, the test may produce 16 of 100 results that are falsely negative. And of all negative tests, 47% then are falsely negative, and the test may miss 16 of 100 patients with real disease due to the high false negative rate. We just saw how we can get into trouble when applying non-invasive testing to very low and very high uh, pretest probability patients. The available tests are very useful for the same reasons in intermediate risk patients. The pretest probability provides the link between test sensitivity and specificity and clinical utility. And because tests are not perfect, even when appropriately applied, the guidelines recognize the need for complementary testing or escalation uh, to invasive testing when results are unexpected or inconclusive. The sensitivity and specificity of stress testing is determined by the physiology of the ischemic cascade as shown here. Coronary CT angiography, if we turn this cascade upside down, shows this test to be very sensitive in picking up atherosclerotic disease and also for excluding its presence. So it is at the very origin of the ischemic cascade. When absolutely normal, this test is a very powerful test. However, it picks up significant atheroma, so it, cannot, it can be nonspecific. Fractional flow reserve testing may be needed when this test shows disease that is intermediate or high, uh, highly uh, significant. Nuclear stress testing operates a bit further down the ischemic cascade, but its high sensitivity <coughs> means that it's 
very able to predict ischemic perfusion abnormalities. Stress echo operates even a little further down the ischemic cascade with evaluation of left ventricular global systolic function and wall motion abnormalities. Let's look at this case of a 56-year-old male with diabetes and hypertension who presented with no chest pain but worsening shortness of breath on exertion and an abnormal EKG. He was unable to exercise due to foot infection. He developed slight test discomfort and augmented ST depression during dobutamine infusion. And there's a suspicion for slight hypokinesis of the mid-lateral wall in this four-chamber view. And you can see the nice endocardium even without an uh, ultrasound enhancing agent. In the apical long axis view, the infralateral wall is normal at baseline in the upper left, but becomes hypokinetic rather than augmented at peak in the lower left. This is a typical ischemic response but it can be subtle as in this case. In our lab, we sometimes acquire global longitudinal strain imaging at baseline and in recovery, though this is not an official protocol. It takes just a couple of minutes, and in this case, the abnormal strain pattern in the left circumflex territory with and without our visual assessment <clears throat> was confirmed with coronary angiography, which shows severe left circumflex disease. So in this case, adding the mechanical indices of lo global longitudinal strain move this stress further down the ischemic, uh, earlier into the ischemic cascade, making it potentially more sensitive. So this and other non-invasive testing are continually undergoing improvements uh, and uh, this, this is a changing uh, environment. In choosing among the non-invasive tests, a position statement of patient-centered medicine was recently uh, published. We would take a personalized approach to testing based on clinical information better than a one test for all patients strategy. For any given clinical presentation, physician's role is to use his or her best judgment to decide on the optimum approach, factoring in the pretest likelihood of disease, patient preference, patient characteristics, equipment avail availability, and technical and reader expertise, which can vary greatly. Thank you for your attention to this talk on non-invasive imaging in chest pain patients and attention to the new guidelines document from the ACC.